Calling Jesus the Messiah isn't exactly a controversial thing in modern Christianity. You'll hear it during church services, any kind of Bible study, and very often during prayer. But this wasn't the case during Jesus' own lifetime. Why would it have been so controversial for Jesus to be called Messiah? Was it a title that he himself claimed? And how would its use have affected the reputation of early Christians? Join us this week on Misquoting Jesus to find out. Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Welcome back to Misquoting Jesus. Today we're talking about Jesus the Messiah, not a controversial title in this day and age, but one that would have caused significant upset in Jesus' own lifetime. We'll be exploring all of that in today's episode, but before we get there, Bart, how are you doing? Yes, I'm doing doing uh, doing a okay. Thanks. Yeah, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, okay. Still going, still ticking along. And we were talking before we started recording um, about the general like busyness of our respective lives. And you said that you had a very interesting New Year's resolution this year. So I thought you could share it. Well, I, I actually have a bunch of resolutions. They all have, <laughs> over half of them have to do with being too busy. <laughs> Cause I, I had kind of a miserable year last year in terms of like <laughs> peace of mind. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so I, I, in addition to my resolution, I gave myself a motto for the year. And my motto for the year is, um, uh, why be happy when you can be busy? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Excellent motto. It's just, you know, we, uh, I know so many people like this, but we try to cram so much into our lives that um, you end up, you know, kind of wondering what the point is. I mean, I, I, half the time, I don't remember what I did yesterday. So why was I in such a hurry to do it? <laughs> It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I'm one of these people like who rushes through to get done with something. I've got to get done because I get to get to the next thing. I get to the next thing and I rush through that to get to the next thing. It's like, you know, this is like, what's the point? <laughs> and so I'm really trying to, to slow down this year and to enjoy things rather than just accomplish things. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. How about you? You, you? I mean, you're you're as busy as I am. What, what, I, what, how are you dealing with this? Trying, honestly, to do the same thing because I have the same tendency uh, I like ticking things off my to-do list and I like achieving and accomplishing things and feeling like I've been productive. And productivity is quite difficult with many small children in the house, as you will know. So I'm trying really hard, especially during things like children's bath times and bedtime routines, which you don't think it's going to take that long, but it takes a very long time to get them all. Yeah. like bathed and in pajamas and into bed. I'm just, I'm trying very hard to tell myself there is nothing more important for you to be doing right now. So stop panicking that it's taking yeah. longer than you think it should. I mean, it's, it's the trick is, and it's a very hard trick to pull off. It takes a lot of kind of person self training, but to enjoy the thing you're doing while you're doing it instead of wishing it were over with, because if you enjoy it while you're doing it, then, you know, that brings joy into your life. Otherwise I, I got, I had a correspondence this week with a guy that, um, who's finishing his PhD at Harvard, who I'm going to be doing a debate with actually on my, uh, not a debate, but like a back and forth. He's an expert on Islam and the Quran. And so we're going to do a thing uh, for my courses where we're going to give lectures on the Quran versus the New Testament on stuff. And he was telling me, he's trying to finish his dissertation. And he said, man, it's hard. I've got two kids and I'm working. I said, yeah, boy, I remember that. I had two young kids and I was working. I was teaching at Rutgers and I was writing my dissertation. He's like, oh my God, this is hard. <laughs> but the thing is, once you get into that pattern, I mean, you probably got in this pattern too. You were a graduate student and you're like, you're working like crazy. And then it sets the pattern for your life. <laughs> Everything, everything has a deadline, even if it actually doesn't. You're like, I have to yeah. get this done because there are so many other things. It just, yeah, yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. I, I understand and I appreciate your uh, your motto for the year. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. <laughs> we should talk about messiahs and Jesus mm -hmm. and all of that associated topic. I wanted to start by asking what the word messiah meant in antiquity yeah well it's a great way to, to start this conversation because most people have no clue uh my my students um you know in chapel hill who are bright bright students most of them are raised in christian homes if i ask them you know who's the messiah supposed to be um one, one idea they typically have is well the messiah is god 
come to earth. Or the Messiah is someone who's supposed to come and die uh, for the sins of the world and be raised from the dead. That's who the Messiah is supposed to be. And they don't, you know, actually, no, <laughs> both of those are wrong. Uh, the, the word Messiah in English is actually a, um, it comes to us from the Hebrew, the, the word Mashiach uh, in Hebrew is the word that means anointed, one who's been anointed with oil. And it was a term used for um especially for kings of Israel, who during their coronation ceremony would have oil poured on their head as part of the ceremony. Just as, you know, today a president gets sworn in, puts his hand on the Bible and swears the oath of office. And it's a ritual that he goes through. Well, the ritual in ancient Israel is having oil poured on the head. And so this person was called the anointed one of God, the Mashiach. And so for, um, for as long as Israel had a king, they were known as the Messiah, the Mashiach, and when there was no longer a king in Israel because uh, the the nation was destroyed, um, some Jewish thinkers thought there'd be a, a future Mashiach, a future king, and so the Messiah was not supposed to be God. I mean, it wasn't supposed to be somebody who died for the sins of the world. It was it was supposed to be the future king of Israel, who, like King David, would drive out the enemy and set up Israel as a sovereign state and would rule with justice. And so that that was the that's what the term Messiah meant. And I should add that that in in English, um, we we also we use the word Christ for for Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah, Christ is uh, is the Greek translation of the word Mashiach. So that Mashiach in Greek, Messiah in Hebrew, is uh, the same word as Christ in in Greek. Now, something that we have talked about before, and raising children in a an American British speaking household, words have different meanings to different people. Did Messiah, Mashiach mean different things to different Jewish groups in antiquity, or was it a relatively coherent word? Uh, well, it was coherent in the sense that it w- it meant God's favored one who had, you know, favored one. It, it meant, broadly meant that. But w- what ended up happening, as I said, is that when Israel got destroyed, the, Ju- Judah got destroyed, uh, they, the, there was no longer a king. And so they're expecting a future person who would be ruling the people of God. And over time, um, there were different expectations that arose about what kind of person that would be. It was still somebody who was God's favored one. But there were some uh, there were some groups that we know about who thought, for example, that the Messiah wouldn't be a human who becomes a great king, but would be a, a like a cosmic judge of the earth who came to overthrow Israel's enemies and set up a kingdom in Israel. And so sometimes they would call this person the Son of Man, based on Daniel chapter seven, or they'd have different titles for this one. But it was understood to be a messianic figure who would who would bring in the kingdom rather than a political figure, a military figure. Other, uh, we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that um, that some Jewish groups uh, thought that the future ruler of Israel who would rule it with power would be a future uh, priest uh, who understood God's law and ruled the nation uh, by the correct interpretation of the law of Moses and th- that he would be a powerful figure. What what all of these have in common is that the Messiah is a future figure who will be a figure of grandeur and power who will wipe out the enemy and rule over the people of Israel. So then do we know of any Jewish groups that thought that this future Messiah would die for the sins of others and then be raised from the dead? Well, that's the thing is that, you know, in Christian thinking, it's just the assumption. Of course, that's what the Messiah is supposed to do. And uh, we have no uh, we have no Jewish authors on record or any Jewish traditions recorded prior to Christianity that come out and say that's what the Messiah is going to be. In fact, there there's no indication that uh, that anyone thought that's what the Messiah was going to be. In fact, it's in some ways, that's the opposite of the Messiah, because the Messiah is supposed to destroy the enemy and set up a kingdom. He's not supposed to be destroyed by the enemy, so he's not supposed to be killed. And there's no tradition of a Messiah rising from the dead before Christianity. And so what, what ends up happening is, as we'll, we'll, we'll expound on this throughout our talk here, but what ends up happening is that um, for reasons we'll see, uh, the followers of Jesus thought that he was the Messiah. And after his death, they knew that he died and they believed he got raised from the dead. And so it was kind of a natural equation. Well, he's the Messiah and the Messiah died and was raised from the dead. So the Messiah is supposed to die and rise from the dead. <laughs> and so that became the way they defined 
Messiah, but it was an innovation. Uh, it was a Christian innovation because this wasn't what what any Jews on record or <laughs> at all thought that the Messiah was supposed to be. So was this something that was placed upon Jesus after his death, or did his followers believe he was the Messiah while he was still alive? Right. So this is kind of an interesting point that um, uh, that I realized way back in graduate school, and not because of I realized it, but because I read a really kind of an amazing piece of scholarship by a, a um, by a Yale New Testament scholar named Niels Dahl, who who pointed out that even if um, the disciples of Jesus um, did believe, you know, knew that he died, believed he got raised from the dead. That never would have made them think, therefore, he's the Messiah, because there is no expectation that the Messiah was going to die and be raised from the dead. And so the idea that he got raised, oh, so he must be the Messiah, doesn't make any sense, unless there was an idea that he was the Messiah before he died. If they thought that he was the Messiah before he died, and then it turns out he didn't do what the Messiah is supposed to do at all. He did the opposite. He got crucified by the enemy, tortured to death publicly instead of overthrowing them. He's just squashed. How, how do you, you know, how do you explain? He gets raised from that. Oh my God, we were right, but we misunderstood what the Messiah is. And so they came to think that the Messiah is the person not who would just conquer the Romans, but who would conquer uh, all of the evil forces in the world, uh, including sin, and bring about salvation. So that became the Christian definition. And once they have that as the definition, then what they start doing is they start looking back in the Hebrew Bible, and they start finding passages that talk about somebody suffering and then being vindicated by God, and they say, those passages are about the Messiah. And so that's that's part of why you end up with conflicts between Jews and Christians in the ancient world, because Christians are saying, look at this passage, Isaiah chapter 53, the Messiah has to die, be raised from the dead. And Jews are saying, wait, that's not even talking about the Messiah. And so it's so you have these conflicts over scripture because Christians are assuming that the that Jesus is the Messiah and therefore the Messiah has to suffer and die. Are there any of the passages that Christians, early Christians and current Christians use to point to the Messiah as suffering and, and dying. Do any of them actually relate to the Messiah or are they all things that are being taken out of context? Well, it depends whether you ask the Christian or the Jew. <laughs> and so, um, but if you, so I'll tell you, I, I think I probably mentioned this before on the, on the podcast. Uh, it is virtually impossible for a Christian to read Isaiah chapter 53 and not think it's talking about Jesus. You just can't do it because it is so ingrained in the thought that Isaiah 53 is talking about a future Messiah who is going to suffer and die and be raised from the dead that it's virtually impossible for a Christian to think otherwise. Um, but if you just read Isaiah 53, th this is uh, in the second part of the book of Isaiah, obviously. And uh, in that part of Isaiah, the author is talking about a person called the servant of the Lord who suffers uh, for the sake of people's sins. And so there are four passages. They're called the four songs of the suffering servant in this part of Isaiah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's written during a time when Judah had been destroyed, the king had been taken off the throne, there's no longer a king, and the, uh, the leaders of Judah are in exile to Babylon, and the author of this part of Isaiah, starting in Isaiah chapter 40, says that God is going to bring them back from exile, that they have, that they have suffered now for the sins of their, uh, of their forebears, and because they suffered for their sins, God's now going to reward them and bring them back from exile back to Israel. Um, and the suffering servant then occurs in, those, in these four passages. When you read these passages about the suffering servant, the word Messiah never occurs period. Uh, and there, there's nothing, it's not about a future suffering Messiah. When it talks about the suffering of the servant in these passages, including Isaiah 53, the suffering is in the past. The vindication is in the future. So this is not predicting somebody's going to suffer. It's talking about somebody who has suffered. 
And it's it's pretty clear if you actually just read these passages, which nobody does, apparently. But if you just read the passage, I didn't for years and years. I just assumed. But you, you just read these passages. The author actually tells you who the servant is. <laughs> he identifies him twice by name. <laughs> the servant is not a future Messiah. Uh, chapter 49, verse 3, Isaiah says, um, he, 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 uh, this is God speaking, and he speaks of, uh, you, my servant, O Israel. Whoa, what? How can it be Israel? Well, the leaders of the people have suffered for the sins of the people, and now they're going to be restored. And so it's an image. It's a metaphor. It's not talking about a future f- person who's going to, God's going to send into the world to die for the sins of the world. Thank you. Why would, when we're thinking about the, uh, the disciples of Jesus and their identification of him as the Messiah and their understanding of what a Messiah is going to do, why would that understanding shift so radically after Jesus' death? I think what happens is there, there has to be, I think there has to be some idea among the disciples that Jesus is going to be the Messiah while he's alive. He's, he, they, they're convinced that he is one who's, who is unusual among them. He is a distinctive being. He's a great religious teacher. They think that in some way he's been sent by God, and they think that he's the one possibly the one who's going to bring about salvation from the enemy. And so they're expecting him to be a Messiah. And since they are, you know, since they're Jews living in the first century, they're in in the twenties of the the common era. um, They, they, if they say, if they think he's the Messiah, they meant what Jews meant when they said he's the Messiah, which meant for most, for most Jews, it meant this political figure. He, he's the one who's going to rouse the troops to drive out the Romans and set up God's kingdom. God, you know, God's going to bring the kingdom back and he's going to use this Messiah to do it. So Jesus is the one. And so they're expecting Jesus probably to, to, to uh, rouse the troops. And it may be what the thing in Jerusalem is all about, that they go to Jerusalem at the end of Jesus' life. And it may be the disciples are thinking, okay, this is the time. We have all these people in Jerusalem for the Passover and Jesus is going to get them together and there's going to be, they're going to, it's going to start a rebellion. And it's going to be, uh, you know, that we're going to drive the Romans out of here, and Jesus will be the king. Um, there are good reasons for thinking. You know, that's not just speculation. There are actually sayings of Jesus in the in the Gospels that uh, that show that this is the kind of thing they were thinking. Um, but it didn't happen. <laughs> and so, uh, as you say, you know, what happened to change it all? Well, what happened is Jesus was captured. He was put on trial, and he was unceremoniously crucified. Um, and so they knew he wasn't the Messiah. Um, you know, well, oh boy, we got that one wrong. And it must have been huge, hugely disappointing. It must have just ripped them apart that they, they, they were wrong and that their Jesus was not a Messiah. But then they came to think he got raised from the dead. The only way to get raised from the dead is if God raises you from the dead. He doesn't do that for everybody. Uh, and so uh, Jesus clearly is the one that God has favored. And if that's the case, they start thinking backwards then. Well, he's been raised from the dead, so shows that he's the one favored by God. But if that's the case, well, he really is the one anointed by God. But then why did he die? <laughs> I mean, because the Messiah is not supposed to die. And they start thinking, you know, the Messiah had to die for the sins of others. He didn't die for his own sins. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. So why would God have him die? And so the Messiah had to die. And the Messiah had to be raised. And, oh, my God, we completely misunderstood this. And everyone else has, too. And so they go out to try and preach to Jews that we've misunderstood what the Messiah is. It's actually somebody who has to die for the sins of the world. And that's how Christianity begins. Did the kind of invention of the suffering Messiah occur around the same time? Or does the, that kind of uh, suffering punishment component come in later? So I think what happens is they, there was nobody expecting the Messiah to die and you know suffer and die and be raised. Jesus, uh, since the disciples are convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, some of them are convinced he's the Messiah. He dies. They believe he gets raised, and that's when the connection gets made. Oh, so he, so he's a suffering Messiah. Whoa, who would have thought that? And so that's why you know one of the reasons Paul calls it a great mystery. He says it's the foolishness of God. It's the weakness of God. In other words, it's not what anybody would have expected. And even, you know, 20, 30 years in Paul's day, most people are saying, no, that's nuts. 
And Paul's saying, yes, it's nuts. It's nuts because it's God's way, not our way, and that God's foolishness is stronger than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And so that's a way of showing that, in fact, yeah, I know it's not what you would have expected, but this is how God's doing it. How do we then start to find out how Jesus viewed himself? Does he ever self-identify as a Messiah in any of the Gospels? So it's, it's interesting to read the Gospels uh, with that question in mind. Um, our first Gospel is Mark. Uh, and in Mark's Gospel, it's very interesting that um, nobody knows who Jesus is the entire time. <laughs> We've talked about this on the podcast before. And, uh, you know, th- nobody gets Jesus. His family doesn't get him. His townspeople don't get him. His disciples don't get him. The Jewish leaders don't get him. And it's only about halfway through the Gospel that anybody realizes that he could be the Messiah, and it's Peter in chapter 8 who realizes that Jesus is the Messiah, but he misunderstands because Jesus then says, yes, and I must go to Jerusalem and be, you know, be killed. <laughs> Peter says, what? No, 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 I just said you're the Messiah. <laughs> and so, so the whole thing is built on the idea that you know, this is like a surprise to everybody, and nobody gets it throughout this gospel. And Jesus actually doesn't self-identify as a Messiah in Mark's gospel until the at the end, he's put on trial before the Jewish high priest and the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. And the high priest puts him under oath and says, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Jesus says, I am. Um, so it's, that's, that's the one place in, in Mark. It's interesting because when you read the Gospel of John, which is our last gospel, uh, unlike Mark, where nobody gets it uh, through the whole thing and it doesn't really come out clearly until the end. Um, In John, in chapter one, (laughs) Peter, the guy who didn't get it in Mark, in chapter one, Peter sees Jesus and says, you're the Messiah. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> and so it's a bit of a difference between Mark and John on this one. But so in the Gospels, um, Jesus does accept the title of Messiah. And he uh, and in different Gospels, he he does he does use it of himself, but rarely. Are there reasons to think that when Jesus is using this title, he is being portrayed as having an understanding of a suffering Messiah, or does he seem to be anticipating that he will lead a military revolution? So this is one place where it's really important to differentiate between what the Gospels say about Jesus and what we can establish as uh, the historical Jesus. Um, so the historical Jesus is, is something that we have to figure out based on our gospel sources. Uh, and so we don't know. You know, we don't know what the gospel sources, um, but we, we, we don't have accurate information from the gospels about what Jesus actually said and did. So we have to infer it based on things that we can establish of him having probably said. Okay, so I'm, I'm setting that up. We need to spend like several episodes trying to show that, <laughs> that you can't just take the gospel. If the gospel says Jesus says something, it doesn't me- necessarily mean he, that he really said it. And the big task of historians since the 18th century <laughs> has been to figure out which things that he, he's recorded as saying, did he really say? Okay, so with that as a preface, let me just say that I think that there's good reason for thinking that Jesus did consider himself a future Messiah. And he did not think about himself as somebody who was going to suffer and die as the Messiah. The Gospels absolutely portray him as someone who's talking about the future suffering of the Messiah. But I don't think historically that's right. I think what's historically the case is that Jesus really expected to be made the king of Israel. Um, that he thought he would be the Messiah in the traditional sense. The way he worked it out, though, was in an apocalyptic way. Uh, the apocalyptic way, uh, what I mean by that is that Jesus as an apocalypticist thought that the end of that the world was controlled by powers of evil now. And uh, they're opposed to God. That God is has allotted a certain amount of time for these forces of evil to be in control. Uh, the time is almost up. And God's going to intervene. He's going to enter into history and destroy the forces of evil and bring earth back to the paradise that it was supposed to be, where there'll be no more pain or misery or suffering. There'll be a kingdom now ruled not by these rotten kingdoms that are in charge now, but a kingdom ruled by God through his Messiah. 
And this kingdom is going to be brought by this cosmic figure, the Son of Man, who's going to come from heaven and destroy everything opposed to God and then set up God's kingdom. Jesus appears to have thought all of that. But he also appears to have thought that when the Son of Man set up the kingdom, there has to be a human who rules it, and the Son of Man is going to make Jesus the king of the kingdom. Um, one reason for thinking that is that there are sayings of Jesus that I think he really did, he almost certainly said in the Gospels that indicate this. One of them, I think there's kind of an interesting argument for why this, this is something Jesus almost certainly said. There's a saying in, in uh, Matthew and Luke where, uh, where Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he talks about, you know, when the Son of Man comes, um, he says to the 12 disciples that he's, during his lifetime, you 12 will be seated on 12 thrones ruling the tribes of Israel, okay, in the, in the future kingdom. So the 12 will each be ruling part of the kingdom of the 12 tribes of Israel in the coming kingdom. Um, and, you know, the, the assumption Jesus seems to have is that you are my 12, and that, in other words, you'll be serving under me, the king, in the coming kingdom. Um, so the reason I think Jesus must have said that is that that's not the kind of saying somebody would make up about Jesus after his death for a reason people might not think of, but it's this. <laughs> He's talking to the 12, including Judas Iscariot. He's saying that you 12 will be on thrones, ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. After Jesus' death, everybody knew that Jesus was betrayed by one of the 12, Judas Iscariot. There's no way after his death, somebody's going to make up a saying that, oh yeah, Judas, you're going to be ruling one of the tribes of Israel. No. And so, so this saying almost certainly goes back to Jesus, which means he really did teach his disciples that they would be uh, ruling under him, which means that he would be the king, which he'd, he'd be the Messiah. And so I think Jesus really expected to be the king, the future king of Israel. Uh, appointed by the Son of Man. And because that expectation was known to his disciples, it's what ends up getting Jesus killed. You know, people think about Jesus' death as, well, you know, the Pharisees were ticked off at him, and so they had him killed. And it's not that at all. He's killed for calling himself the future king. When, when he's crucified, the placard over his head is, this is the king of the Jews. Ha, ha, ha. In other words, making fun of his claim. And um, the, whole, the trial, are you the king of the Jews? You say I am. Well, it's all about him being the king of the Jews, and that's what he claimed, and that's why he ended up being crucified. So he, I think Jesus thought he was going to be the future Messiah. Interesting. Thank you. So if he thought he was the Messiah and, and therefore the future king, did he also think he was the son of God? Ah, right. So um, these titles are really tricky because they're so misunderstood by everybody, and it's understandable they're misunderstood. Uh, everyone misunderstands these things. I used to completely misunderstand them. Um, in my book, uh, I wrote this book called How Jesus Became God, and I had to explain how some of these titles work because it's completely, you know, the Messiah, Messiah is not the only one my students misunderstand. You know, it's not that Messiah is God or the one who has to suffer. So two other titles people misunderstand are Son of Man, and son of God. <laughs> and when we hear that Jesus is both son of man and son of God, just naturally we think, well, that means that he's both human and divine, right? Son of man, so he's a human, son of God, so he's divine. And, and that is what theologians in early Christianity ended up saying about these titles. But these titles were not floating around in Greek circles where these theologians came out of. They were coming from Jewish circles. And so what you have to ask is, in the first century, say in the 20s when Jesus was living, what does the term son of man mean and what does the term son of God mean? Son of man ironically, does not refer to a human. <laughs> it refers to this cosmic figure who's coming to judge the earth based on Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel talks about one like a son of man. In other words, one in kind of human form. Um, and so the son of man is this divine cosmic figure who's judging the earth. And so just as the son of man is actually a divine figure, son of God in Judaism at the time is a human figure. <laughs> the term son of God is frequently used of the king of Israel throughout the Old Testament. Uh, the king of Israel is the son of God. And for one, one place you can see this most clearly is when uh, David is being promised by God that he'll always have an, a descendant on the throne. Uh, this is in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
where uh, David is told by the prophet, speaking God's word, that um, that David's son will be God's son. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. So the son of God uh, is used frequently of the king uh, of Israel in the Old Testament and of other figures. And the the thing that ties these these various designations, these various figures together as being son of God, is that these are are um, these are the representatives of God on earth who mediate His will, and so God's up in heaven, and He's in charge of the earth. But his, He's got to if He's going to work here on earth, He's got to work through somebody, and so for example, He works through the King, the Son of God, or sometimes uh, in Hosea chapter eleven verse one, the nation of Israel is called the Son of God, because Israel is the one through whom God works His will. So out of Egypt have I called my son. Sometimes angels are called the sons of God because they're the ones who come down to earth and do what God wants them to do down here. And so son of God uh, does not does not necessarily mean that a person is God. It means that it's a person or an angel or some, some subservient being to God who is being used by God to mediate his will. So did Jesus think he was the son of God? Yes. I mean, he thought that he was the one through whom God was speaking. But that does not mean that he thought that he like pre-existed and was with God in the beginning and created the universe. It doesn't mean that. It later comes to mean that, but it's not what Jesus would have meant if he took the title Son of God or what anyone else would have taken he meant by saying that they were the Son of God. Excellent. Thank you so much. We are going to wrap up there, take a quick break, and we'll be back with a weekly update. If you're interested in the Gospels of the New Testament, the book of Genesis, the resurrection of Jesus, the historicity of the Exodus, or anything else connected with the Bible, you should check out my online courses, where I cover all these topics and more. If you'd like to learn about the courses, check them out at bartermancom You can receive a discount on any of your purchases simply by entering the code MJPODCAST. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. We are back. Thank you, everybody, for uh, waiting for us. Now, we are going to be talking very briefly about a couple of lectures that Bart has coming up called Did Peter Hate Paul? This is going to be March 30th. It's a live lecture free to attend, and you can sign up at barterman.com forward slash Peter and Paul. But what is this about? Yeah, so this is going to be fun. So, as you said, these are free. So, that, you know, every now and then I do these free courses just, you know, so we can spread knowledge a little bit and people can see the kinds of things we do. And and uh, this one, Did Peter Hate Paul? Uh, that, that might sound kind of surprising to some people and to other people it won't sound surprising at all. Because they're uh, just, just as in the New Testament, <laughs> even today, there are people who think uh, different things about Peter and Paul. Uh in the book of Acts in the New Testament, Peter and Paul are the two major figures. Like Peter's Jesus' disciple who's become the leader of the church. Paul's the great convert who becomes a great missionary, and they agree on everything. Uh, and so you have that portrayal in the New Testament that Peter and Paul are kind of working together in tandem for everything. But you also get suggestions in the New Testament that Peter and Paul were at odds with each other. And you especially get that in one of Paul's own letters, uh, the letter to the Galatians, where it looks like they had a knockdown, drag out argument about something rather significant. And Paul never indicates that they reconciled. <laughs> and so, and so throughout, throughout early Christianity, you had these two different strains, some saying that, you know, they were completely simpatico and this other strain saying they were at each other's throats. And we have clear indications of these, they're at each other's throats thing. <laughs> and if so, what was it about? And uh, and pe even people who think they read each other's throats don't really understand what it was about. I th in my experience, uh, most people don't really quite get it. They they misconstrue it. So this these two lectures are going to be about that about how that happens. You have these two strains of tradition and what each one really is all about. And you know, can we say anything historically about whether uh, which which side's probably right? Excellent. Thank you very much. I we don't have anything from peter saying how he felt about paul do we 
<laughs> well, we don't have anything for Peter. Yeah, <laughs> One of the shit. things I'm going to be arguing in this lecture, though, is we have, to, we have a lot of books that claim to be written by Peter. And the interesting thing is the two that are in the New Testament, first and second Peter, I'll, I'll be talking about whether I think Peter probably wrote them or not. Um, but they show Peter and Paul completely together. But ones outside the New Testament show that Peter's really ticked off at Paul. <laughs> <laughs> calls him my enemy <laughs> and so uh and so uh yeah so yeah that'll be part of the part of the lectures strong words from paul there mm. oh, well okay so if that sounds interesting to anybody listening again you can sign up at bartemancom forward slash peter and paul uh, and they are happening on march 30th and i assume they will be available to view for people who can't make the live recording date is that correct yeah, we're gonna we'll be recording it live. There'll be a Q and A uh, after the two lectures, and um, then uh, anybody who wants it can get it. All they have to do is sign up. They need to sign up to come to the live, uh, and it'll be free. And and uh, if they can't come, they can still sign up and get. And we'll send them send them the recordings. Excellent. Thank you very much. We are going to go over to some uh, listeners' questions now. Now it's time for Questions from Listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by Misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash askbart. Okay, as ever, a fantastic mix of questions from our wonderful listeners. And if you are interested in asking Bart a question, you can go to the website. There is a link there. Question one, I understand that the content of the Q source is derived from shared passages of Matthew and Luke. Are there passages in Matthew but not in Luke, or vice versa, that scholars argue may have originated with Q because of the similarities to other sayings from Q? Ah, this is a good question. So uh, for those, those who don't quite understand it, Q is this source that scholars hypothesize uh, once existed that was used by both Matthew and Luke uh, when you have this situation where you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and sometimes all three have the same story, and it's usually thought Matthew and Luke got it from Mark. Um, but then you have stuff in Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark, like the Lord's Prayer or the Beatitudes, or and they tend to be sayings, almost, almost entirely, but not entirely sayings. But since they agree word for word, either Luke got it from Matthew or Matthew got it from Luke, there are reasons for thinking neither one of those is right. And so if that's not right, they must have got it from a common source. And so they call this common source Q. Uh, Q is the source for Matthew and Luke's material that's not found in Mark. A strict definition of Q is just that. It's when Matthew and Luke have stuff that, that, that is word for word the same, but not in Mark. By definition, that if you accept all of these assumptions, that would be Q. And so this questioner is asking, uh, a very good question, because let's imagine, so when, when Matthew and Luke both took stuff from Mark, sometimes Matthew took something from Mark that Luke did not take from Mark. And sometimes Luke took something from Mark, something that Matthew did not take from Mark. Okay. But you can tell that's the case because you've got Mark. <laughs> and so you can see what Mark has, you can see, but you don't have Q. And so is it possible that Matthew took stuff from Q that Luke did not, and that Luke took stuff from Q that Matthew did not? And do, what do scholars think about that? Well, I mean, as a scholar, I'll say, sure, why not? <laughs> I mean, I don't want, I mean, what, uh, yes, <laughs> I think it's, but then the question is, well, how do you know? And that's what, the, that's what this question is, how would you know? And some scholars do argue these things. They'll take, a, for example, a parable or a saying of Jesus that sounds like other sayings or parables of Jesus in Q, and so maybe it came from Q. Um, the way they do this, I'm not going to get way down into the weeds now, but the way that you have to argue that is when Matthew takes over stuff from Mark or Q, he, he often puts his own spin on it. Like maybe it'll be a grammatical feature. Like he'll, he'll phrase something in a certain way, or he'll use one of his favorite terms or like he'll modify it slightly the way he just modifies Mark. He'll do that with Q as well. And Luke will do the same thing. So if you've got a saying that's in Matthew that, um, that like these other Q sayings, and there are no indications of Matthew's kinds of changes in it, scholars call those no redactional elements of Matthew in it, then that, that the argument is that would increase the likelihood it came from Q and that Luke simply didn't take it over. 
and vice versa. So it's completely possible. Uh, and I'll add to this that scholar, when I was in graduate school, the consensus was Q did not have a, have a uh, passion narrative because you don't have passion narrative materials about Jesus' death and resurrection in Matthew and Luke not found in Mark. And so Q didn't have a passion narrative. And I've always thought that's nuts. How do you know that? If suppose Q had a passion narrative and Matthew took it over and Luke did not, then you just wouldn't know. <laughs> and so, um, right. It's an excellent question and uh, you could devote a book to it. And uh, actually there probably are people who have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, to what extent did Greco-Roman religions, traditions, and philosophies influence the development of Christian theological constructs? Uh, well, to a great deal, I'd say. I mean, even within the New Testament, um, just to give you one example, in uh, Greek and Roman religions, you have stories, myths about uh, about people who are semi divine. The you know uh, the parent, a father will be uh, will be a god, and the the mother will be a mortal, and. Um, and you have ways of telling stories of, uh, about these people. They're miraculously born. They're wunderkind uh, when they're young. They they end up doing miracles. They can heal people, and they can like raise the dead. And they, at the end of their lives, they ascend to heaven. And you know, so you get you get these stories, and they clearly influence the gospels in ways. The Gospel of Luke, which people often say is like the most Gentile of our gospels, has more of these features than the other two. Uh, it just kind of it lines up just in, in broad terms with these kinds of things. And so you, you, you get that. So early on, you have influence, I think, of Greek and Roman traditions on the Christians. Most, most Christians, by the time the Gospels are being written, are not from Jewish stock. They, they were raised with Greek and Roman myth and Greek and Roman ways of understanding things. Another way, for example, is in Greek and Roman understandings, um, the, when the body dies, the soul lives on. And that's not the view within Judaism. It's not the view Jesus had or the view that the Old Testament has. And in Jewish thinking, the soul cannot exist apart from the body. But in the Greek thinking, it did exist apart from the body. Uh, and so that becomes the standard Christian doctrine, that you die and your soul goes to heaven or hell. That's that's a Greek idea from that you first expressed most um, forcefully by Plato. Um, it's not a Jewish idea. And so it's Greek and Greek influence. Later, what ends up happening is that the philosophical debates within Greek philosophy come to influence Christian theology. And so the, the, the debates that you start having, serious theological debates in the 4th and 5th centuries, are almost entirely informed by Greek um, metaphysical categories of understanding like the world and the divine realm and so forth. Thank you. Uh, this question says, I feel a little annoyed every time I come across the word hell in the Gospels and see in the footnote that it translates Gehenna. Knowing that it had far different connotations for apocalyptic Judaism than the endless torture for the fundamentalist Christian hell, can scholars not agree on a better rendering? And how would you translate it in a short word or phrase? Um, I would translate it Gehenna. <laughs> Gehenna is a valley. It's the valley of the sons of Hinnom outside of, uh, of Jerusalem. And when it's used in the, in the Gospels, it's used the way you can find it through other places in the Bible, in the, the Hebrew Bible, as a, as a place that was desecrated and that was uh, the most, like, horrible place on earth because uh, it's where uh, pagans practiced uh, human sacrifice. They would sacrifice children there, allegedly. And so when Jesus says you'll be cast into Gehenna, uh, if, if, you know, if you don't behave, you're going to be cast into Gehenna. What he means is your corpse will be defiled and you will be thrown into this horrible, god-awful place. That, that was a horror for many people in the ancient world, not to be given a proper burial, well attested throughout numerous cultures, that when you died, you wanted to have an honorable burial. And Jesus is saying, you're not just going to be like, you know, thrown into a trash heap. You're going to be thrown into Gehenna. It's like, oh my God, that's as bad as it gets. When you translate it hell, you think about like, you know, the devil and demons like poking hot irons into your eyes and stuff. And that's not what this is talking about at all. So it's a complete mistranslation, I think, to call it hell. Just as in the Old Testament to translate Sheol as hell is a mistranslation. Our ideas of hell developed long after these books were written. Thank you. Final question. 
The census in Luke has always been odd, as having people all go to their ancestral home would seem to defeat the purpose of a government census. However, I've thought maybe this idea comes from reading the census from the Torah, where it would list the number of people by their tribe and ancestry. Could the author of Luke possibly have used this for a template as to how a census work, uh, worked, since the gospel authors seem to have some familiarity with Old Testament literature? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's possible. I mean, Luke, um, Luke's census is, is a little bit strange because uh, it says that during the reign of Caesar Augustus, there was, a, there was a census census for the entire world, which I suppose must mean the entire Roman Empire. And so everybody's going to register for the census. There were censuses done in the Roman world. Um, they were not they were not that uncommon. Um, in, in ancient Israel, those censuses that the questioner is asking about were done in order to decide how many um, military age men there were. Uh, and so you have, to, you, you, you have to figure out what your troop strength is. And, th- and that was one of the reasons for doing them in the Roman world as well. You wanted to know uh, where, how, how many people could serve in the armies. Uh, proportionately to the to the population, also for tax purposes in the Roman world, uh, you wanted to know what the what the population density was, uh, so that you could figure out how to do the appropriate taxes. Um, but neither really makes sense for uh, people going to their ancestral homes, <laughs> uh, you know, because you really you, the idea of a census is to know how many people are in a particular place, not where their you know ancestors were a thousand years ago, and so so it doesn't make sense. So Luke may have something like the Old Testament in mind, but it's usually thought, especially since he's dating this to the time of Quirinius, the governor of Syria, who was later known to have done a census. That he's actually probably being more influenced by what's going on with censuses in his own day in the Roman world. There never was an empire-wide census at any time. It wouldn't make any sense, and there um, and and there are other problems with the census. But I think he's probably being influenced by stuff in his own day. Thank you. But before we finish for the week, would you mind just summarizing what we spoke about today? Yeah. So we've been talking about the the term Messiah. Um, it's a it's a term that people frequently uh, think of today when they think about Jesus. And the question is, historically, where did it come from? What did the term Messiah actually mean historically? And what would it have meant in Jesus' day? Um, was there anyone who th- among Jews who thought that the Messiah would be somebody who would be crucified and raised from the dead? Apparently, no. Uh, but the Jew- followers of Jesus came to think that. They came to think that probably because they thought he might be the Messiah before he died. And after he died, they realized he'd been raised from the dead, and that made them change their definition of Messiah, away from being a future leader of the people who would overthrow the enemy and set up God's kingdom, to a person who would die for the sins of the world and then be raised from the dead. Thank you, Bart. Audience, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember, you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartermann.com and that his upcoming two lecture series on March 30th, Did Peter Hate Paul, is free. You can attend uh, and register at bartermann.com forward slash Peter and Paul. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week, but what are we talking about next time? So next time we're we're talking about a, a topic that that's uh, distantly related <laughs> to my uh, the course I'm going to be doing. Did Peter hate Paul? We're gonna we're gonna do a course on what we we're gonna do a, a podcast on what do we know about Peter? I mean, uh, you know, what, what kind of sources of information do we have? And uh, like, do we have anything he wrote and that kind of thing? So it's going to be about uh, kind of basic information about the uh, disciple Peter. Thank you all and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us.